Hi, this is Ron Broussard, and now we'll be covering Chapter 2, Workforce Safety and Wellness of the EMT. So, with this NEMS in the healthcare field in general, um, there is a lot of stress, a lot of hardships that we'll be dealing with uh, in our everyday job. Every call that we go on carries a high level of stress, um, you know, not only for the patients, but for us also. Now, like everything in this class, you guys are going to hear that safety is always going to be the number one priority all the time. Again, you cannot help somebody else if you yourself become hurt or become a victim or a patient. Now, with that, some of these scenes that we come into, patients are going to be in this wide range of an emotional state uh, where they may be angry, they may be sad, they may be, you know, uh, withdrawn. Uh, we just need to be prepared to deal with those different states that they're in. Now, and lastly, we need to be able to work on our own health and make sure that we are healthy so we can provide the best care possible to our patients. Now, we are going to deal with death and dying in this field. It is just a fact of life in what we do. Okay. With this, we should understand that patients are going to experience different emotional stages. Now, this has the, the five stages of, of grief or death for, uh, for this textbook. Okay, so the five emotional stages are going to be denial. That's where they get, you know, they refuse to believe that this is happening. It's like, it can't be me. It's like, I don't have that disease. You know, that's not me. It's no way, you know. And then they have anger. Of course, that's going to be where they have this kind of a, well, why is this happening to me? Like, why me? What's going on with this? Why do I have this? And they may be really angry and upset about, you know, a, a diagnosis of a condition or the fact that death is uh, approaching. Uh, with bargaining, bargaining is kind of a, a, a reflection of it's like, man, I haven't I, I haven't done this yet. But just, you know, if I only have a little bit more time, you know, I'll, I'll call my grandson. If I only had a little bit more time, you know, I, I would do this. But, you know, let me do this first before, you know, I go, you know, so they're trying to, to bargain, you know, for, for more time to to accomplish something. OK. Uh, and then depression, that's, again, more with the, the self-reflection of, you know, it's like, man, uh, I, I haven't really you know, done everything that I want to do. Like, I, I haven't had an opportunity to, to experience, you know, this trip or, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to see, you know, my, my grandchild be born, you know, and they kind of self-reflect and they look at what they haven't done yet. And then lastly, you have this acceptance stage where it's they, they understand, you know, that the, the end is near and they, they accept the fact that they are going to pass. And, and a lot of people, especially in a hospice, they are ready for that time to come because, you know, the, the dying process isn't, you know, pain free. And it's oftentimes they get to that point where it's like, OK, I'm ready. Uh, understand that this is not a step by step by step approach okay so it's not they're not going to experience denial then anger and then bargaining and then depression uh, they are going to experience you know any number of these in any order uh, they don't have to experience all of them they don't have to experience them in step-by-step -step order and just because they've been in denial and now they're feeling depressed uh, doesn't mean that they can't go back into denial uh, and everybody experiences this differently. You'll have to also deal with the family that's going to be having their own emotional stages that they're dealing with. Okay. Now, with this, we have an obligation to help the patient. Okay. Um, understand that if we arrive on scene and the patient is deceased and say they have, you know, a, a DNR, but we were called to the home and uh the family's there and we are not going to resuscitate the patient or if say the patient's obviously dead which we'll talk about in a later chapter kind of what we're looking for to withhold resuscitation that doesn't mean that we just you know brush our hands of this and then and then leave no we need to now focus on the family and provide some emotional care 
uh, for the family members also. I mean, you're, I know we're not counselors, you know, we're not psychologists, but again, we're just gonna gonna be there for the family. You're not just gonna like leave the scene and like be up and available for the next call. Okay, you need to just understand that you need to be supportive. You need to be supportive for the patients. Okay. Now, with uh, ways to reduce emotional burden, uh, do everything that you can to allow the patient, allow the family to express themselves. Okay, show respect for the patient. You know, if they've, you know, they have a condition where you know they are probably going to pass soon, and they've defecated on themselves. Well, clean the patient up if they're. Uh, exposed, you know, cover them up. Just do everything you can to respect the patient's dignity. Now, understand that the family may be angry. They may see something. They may have an experience with a previous provider uh, that was, you know, subpar in their mind and they just may be angry and they want to get that off of their chest. Allow them to express themselves. Allow them to to be free to to say whatever it is that they want to say and understand that they're upset, okay? Um, with the family, just don't give them any false assurances. Don't tell them that things are gonna be okay because we can't guarantee that they're gonna be okay. Don't tell them that everything's gonna be fine. It's okay, time heals all wounds. You know, that's not something that people wanna hear right off the bat. So we don't wanna tell them that's okay, you'll feel better you know, in a little bit. You know, just, you know, I, under, I understand that you're upset you know, and if you want to say anything, go ahead and, and say what you'd like to say. All uh, right, now with some of the emotional aspects of working in EMS, uh, we deal with some high stress situations and a lot of stressors related to what we do. Okay, long hours. Uh, that's kind of you know, part of the course. Um, I don't think we have like your standard shift work. Uh, you're either going to be working probably a 12 or a 24 hour shift or even like a 48 hour shift. I know some agencies do, you know, 48 hours on and then a, a, you know, four days off. Uh, but then there's always the overtimes that pop up. You know, boredom between calls. That is a real thing. Now, when I was working on the ambulance, uh, you know, I, I did not have a smartphone. I was very slow to the game for, for smartphones and probably gonna date myself here but i mean i had a flip phone and it was when smartphones were a thing so uh when we were waiting for a call and we we're on a street corner post and i'm sitting in the ambulance and all i have is my flip phone if you don't have a good relationship with your partner you know you're gonna have a very boring time uh so there are gonna be those moments where you're just waiting for that next call now working too much too hard uh, that is also a real thing. You know, we are in the time of uh, COVID right now and uh, everything is, you know, kind of heightened. So, you know, when COVID first started, people kind of stopped calling 911, kind of stopped going to the hospital because they were worried they're going to get sick. And now people are back into like, OK, so I'm not feeling good. I'm going to go get looked at. And so the call volume is a lot higher. I'm a, I'm a nurse in the ER and, you know, I know our patient volumes are significantly higher. Um, and you want to work, you want to get stuff done. And so you might not get that lunch break. You might not be able to take that time. And then not only that, but all these overtime shifts are, you know, coming available and you're wanting to work that overtime to get that money, but then you're exhausting yourself in the process. Okay. Now getting little recognition. I think that's one thing that, uh, is kind of changing. I feel like, uh, EMS and uh, healthcare providers are, you know, been a real focal point uh, in our society today and are starting to get some of the recognition that they deserve, which is great. Um, but, you know, that's something that is lacking, you know, it's like where people aren't necessarily seeing what you do or not understanding what you do. It can be difficult to deal with. And then having to respond instantly. Uh, that is something that is very hard for people, you know, especially if you're not wired that way or programmed that way. Uh, you really never know what you're going to get, you know, with a call. You may have a call that is, you know, I've gotten called out for, for food poisoning. You know, that's how the call came down 
And then I show up on scene and the patient's, you know, diaphoretic and heavy chest pain. And, you know, we put him on the monitor and he's having a STEMI, you know, which is a, a major heart attack, you know, and it was like, oh my gosh. And now that totally changed kind of the, the, the pace of the call. What we were thinking was going to be a transport to our closest facility is now transport to the cardiac center, you know, so the patient can go directly to the cath lab and it kind of changed everything. So you need to be able to you know, be flexible and be able to adapt to those calls. Okay, now some high stress situations or stressors related to patient care, okay, making life and death decisions and fearing serious errors. Uh, that, that is real. You know, we are affecting people's lives with everything that we do. Uh, as EMTs, you guys have medication that can affect people's, you know, blood pressure. You guys give nitroglycerin uh, that is in, you know, your scope to assess uh, and to assist a patient with their nitroglycerin administration. Now, I had a patient just the other day in the ER that, you know, she took her nitro without checking her blood pressure and bottomed her out and EMS brought her in unconscious, you know, and that was, that's something that you guys are going to have to be thorough with. And it can be very stressful and recognizing that you are responsible for somebody else's life, that you are going to need to provide, you know, appropriate care to that person. Now, one thing that we'll point out that's really tough is abuse and neglect of pediatric patients and geriatric patients. Just in general, those patients that aren't able to protect or advocate for themselves, uh, you know, if you're seeing a patient that is getting, you know, abused or neglected, uh, it can be very hard to kind of separate the emotion from that to focus in on what you have to do, you know, as an EMT. Like if you're, you know, called to a pediatric patient who is talking to you and telling you things that, you know, the a parent is doing, you know, it could be very hard for you to not want to react emotionally and be you know, maybe inappropriate with that parent, but you just need to focus in on caring for your patient and then following the proper reporting procedures and then not, you know, lashing out at the parent or the caretaker. <clears throat> and caring for infants and children, that is tough. That, that is hard. Do I see it in the ER? We deal with it a lot. On the ambulance, one of my most stressful calls that I had, I mean, initially working on the ambulance was a, a small kid who uh, I think was 11 months old and had croup and just, you know, had some strider as we were transporting. And all I was doing was holding a humidified blow by oxygen by this little kid's face. Mom was in the back of the ambulance and, you know, she was staring at me like a hawk. I mean, I, I was like sweating with that call just because it was this little baby who is, you know, had some striders, you know, respirations that we were hearing. Uh, it was, it was stressful for me. And so when you're dealing with calls with kids, you know, uh, it can be something that is challenging. Mass casualty incidents, you know, or multiple casualty incidents where you have, you know, more patients than resources available, okay, can carry a high level of stress because now you're needing to triage. You're needing to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people, uh, which requires some, you know, some difficult decisions to be made, to say the least. Okay, uh, we'll talk about triage later in this class. And then injury or death of a coworker. I hope nobody ever has to experience that. You know, me coming again from military background in the EMS and now in the in the nursing. Um, you know, it's it, it's never great to lose somebody who you work with, especially in this field. You build these strong bonds. Uh, it's really hard to lose a, a you know coworker, brother, sister. You know, kind of a family environment. Uh, so it can be difficult to lose those people that you work with. Okay, now stress reactions. Now, there are three different types of stress reactions that the book talks about. You have acute stress, delayed stress, and then cumulative stress. Now, as with acute stress, that's just kind of you are in the moment. You get this sympathetic nervous system, you know, stimulated like this fight or flight uh, type stimulation. Sorry, getting a little ahead of myself. We haven't dove into anatomy physiology yet. Uh, but you can think about this if you've ever had to do, say, public speaking, if you've ever had that near miss in a car accident where it's like you get a little sweaty, your hands sweat, you feel your heart pounding in your chest, breathing goes up a little bit, you feel anxious. All right, that's an acute stress reaction. OK, now with a delayed stress reaction that we're talking more along the lines of 
like PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, where you've been removed from that stressor, okay, like let's say you had a call for a pediatric patient, right, that was a, that coded and you had to do CPR on, all right, you're in that call, you're doing your compressions, uh, I mean, but you are, you feel just anxious, you feel like your heart's pounding in your chest, you're sweating, okay, and, and not because of the the, the physicality of doing CPR, just of what the call is, you know, pediatric arrest. Uh, and now you, you've done your job, you know, weeks later, now you're starting to relive that event and it's stimulating that same stress reaction. Okay, I feel like my heart's pounding in my chest. I feel like I can't catch my breath. I feel I feel sweaty. Oh my gosh, you know what if I just I need to jump out of my own skin kind of a thing, you know? Uh that's considered now a delayed stress reaction. So you've been pulled out of the stressor, you're no longer in it, but you're still getting a similar reaction from it. And now cumulative stress reaction, that that is, you know, what we're talking about with a burnout. So with burnouts, you know, it just working too much, too hard. You may find yourself being irritable, find yourself not able to sleep. You know, you're not, you're not sleeping well at all. And which of course makes you more irritable. You don't want to be around other people. You don't want to be around other people. Why? Because they agitate you. Uh, that guys, the biggest thing is like you need to be able to self-reflect and, and recognize, you know, okay, hey, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm I'm burnt out, <laughs> like, you know, I've been working too much overtime. All right, recognize that so you can dial back a little bit in your life, because the last thing you want to do is have this now flow over onto your patients, you know, where you used to be able to, you know, uh, deal with the patient that, you know, maybe, you know, in your eyes it wasn't as critical as you thought it was. Yeah. You know, should be for a 911 call, but normally you're able to deal with that pretty well and you're able to be polite and respectful and, you know, treat the patient with dignity, you know, but now you're finding yourself just short, you know, you're, you're kind of dismissing the patient's complaints, you know, recognize that and be like, you know, maybe I should take a step back and kind of take, take some time off, maybe go to a, um, a less busy station where I'm not running as many calls. Okay. Now, general categories of stress findings, you know, are thinking, psychological, uh, physical, behavioral, and uh, and social. Now, with thinking, that's what we're just talking about. You get, like, kind of the inability to make judgment calls, all right? Like, if you find it more and more difficult to, like, remember things, okay? Maybe you don't feel as, as motivated to, to go out and do things that you would normally do. All right, now the psychological, that's where we're talking about, you know, depression. Maybe you're getting a little bit angry with people, uh, get a little hostile, kind of have these ups and downs, mood swings, you know, where it's like, hey, you're, you're pretty good one minute, but somebody could say something and, you know, kind of flip you into this anger mode. Okay, now physical, that's where you're just like exhausted. Like you're not wanting to get up out of bed and do things anymore. Um, you're Maybe feeling like your your heart's pounding in your chest. You're having like you know stomach issues. Kind of, you get ulcers from stress. That's a real thing. Uh, but we're talking about like the physical effects now on your body. Okay, behavioral. Uh, here's what we're talking about: like self medicating. So going in, maybe you have a lot of stress at work. So you come home. It's like oh, I'm just gonna have this glass of wine, or I'm gonna have you know. I'm going to have this beer. I'm going to have this glass of whatever it is that you drink. All right. I know California, you know, marijuana is legal. I'm just going to do this, you know, and it's going to make me feel better. We'll recognize that, you know, we shouldn't be self-medicating. You guys should want to resolve the problems, you know, the appropriate way and seeking, you know, mental health professionals to help you because with self-medication, you're simply masking the problem. You're masking the symptoms, not actually addressing the symptoms. Because once that buzz wears off and goes away, what happens? You're you're right back in that same situation. The stressors are still there. You know, you still have all the same stuff going on. It's just now, okay, well, now I need to drink again to make those die down. Now with social, 
that's where we talk about interpersonal relationships. So your relationships with others uh, kind of deteriorating. And I'm not just talking about, you know, your, your friends, but, your, you know, your spouse, even your patients, you know, your relationships with them. Like you used to be able to build this great rapport and your patients used to talk to you a lot more and give you a lot of information. And just now with the way that you're presenting yourself, they're, they're short and they're kind of guarded and they're not wanting to share information with you. So these are some aspects to, to kind of pay attention to. All right. So with stress management, you guys need to focus on your own mental health and your physical health. Okay. Uh, I know I can tell you right off the bat that. I perform better at work when I exercise. <laughs> like if I don't exercise for a few days, I notice it. My wife even notices it. She's like, you know, you should probably work out. You know, I notice you're a lot more, a lot more patient when you when you go and exercise. And I'm like, okay, you know, that makes sense. You know, but exercise, proper diet, eating, <laughs> how we, you know, in EMS, it, it becomes a challenge because you have to eat fast. I know. And I take my lunch breaks in the ER, if you can even call them that. It's like I go into the break room and I just stuff my face as fast as I can to go back out there so I don't get behind. Um, you know, it can be hard. So when you're working on an ambulance, I know we would go to get fast food all the time. And that's kind of defeating the purpose. You know, also with your diet, caffeine, reducing the amount of caffeine. It's, again, easier said than done with what we're doing. I know I'm like two cups of coffee in the morning kind of guy, but that's going to add to stress at work. Okay. So big thing, exercise often avoid self-medication though. So drinking, using drugs, you know, that are prescribed to you, uh, in order to, to mask some of the symptoms that you're feeling. Okay. We've talked a little bit about diet, uh, you know, reducing your sugars, um, kind of finding a healthy balance. For what you're eating now, i'm not a dietitian uh and there are a lot of different diets out there i just would encourage you to uh, do your research uh with any kind of diet but the big things reducing coffee uh or not coffee but caffeine i know energy drinks are the biggest thing right now or all the rage uh reducing your energy drinks reducing caffeine um and again making uh better decisions as far as what you're putting in your body okay and then learning to relax finding the time to do that okay like when i come home after a shift you know one thing that i like to do is i kind of just like to wind down quiet and like watch something familiar on tv you know i'm not going to put on a new scary movie that's just going to stretch me out i'll put on a movie that i've seen a hundred times just so i can have some background noise and i can kind of dial down for my day and that's my way to relax and it's just finding what works for you Okay, now with recognizing the responses of family and friends. Now, this is going to be big because with a lack of understanding. Like, you know, they don't work in the healthcare field. They might not have any medical knowledge at all. And so when you're talking about a call, you know, or you're talking about, say, uh, you know, a motor vehicle collision where uh, you got to do all of these interventions. I love healthcare, you know, and I, I, I love what I do. Like, I as a combat medic uh, for an airborne unit, you know, I've been able to be on patients that have had, you know, fractured their femurs where we've applied traction splints. And it makes me feel, you know, good knowing that I'm able to do my job and I'm able to do all these skills that I've trained for. And so when I go home, I'm like excited, you know, about, you know, the new experience that I've had or an experience that I've had. And I'll tell my wife about it. You know, it's like, oh, I did. I had a to do this intervention and she's like it's weird that you're excited it's like well i'm not excited for the patient i'm just excited that i got to to do a skill that i've trained so hard for you know so uh it, it's interesting because they don't really necessarily understand kind of what's going on you know and so with a uh, fear of separation yes you're going to be gone a lot you know you're going to be working a lot and so you're gone uh the field that we're in is you know a dangerous field uh so that fear of like losing me of course is there inability to plan uh you know i have my schedule now about six weeks in advance but there's always overtimes that pop up and there's always the availability to work more shifts and so 
my wife may want to put down a plan on the calendar, but the next thing you know, it's like, boom, there's an overtime or you get forced. That happens. You may have a schedule like, hey, I have my two days on. I'm going to go home. But that next person doesn't show up because they're sick. Something happens. And now it's like, no, you're forced. You can't go home right now. You know, it's a real thing. You know, if you want to work in the fire service, they have, you know, holes where you, know, you have those wildland fire guys. They'll go out for months at a time, you know, and, and be gone. If you think that's like, what well, me and my wife had this, you know, trip planned for the weekend. It's like, that kind of goes out the window at that point. Uh, and then, you know, frustrated desire to share. And that kind of goes back to the lack of understanding. Um, you know, there's, there are things that they don't understand. So it can be difficult to, to share certain aspects. There's also things that we deal with that are really stressful and it's hard to share or it's hard to talk about. Okay, so making changes in your work environment. Now, developing a buddy system, you know, with a coworker. Now, this is great because you have that person that is going through the same things that you're going through. All right, that creates understanding. Okay, not only that, but you guys can hold each other accountable for things. Like, let's say it's like you decide to go on a diet and you and your buddy decide, hey, we're going to do it together. You have that other person now to hold you accountable to that. You know, it's a lot easier to fall off a diet plan or fall off an exercise plan when you're doing it by yourself. But when you have somebody else in it with you, kind of holds you to it. Okay, now, encourage and support coworkers resist temptation to dwell on the negative. Um, you know, that that is an important thing. Uh, it, it's okay to express yourself. Just don't stay in the negative, all right? It's okay to be frustrated about things and to say that you're frustrated, but the important thing is to come back up and become positive again, all right? Because I know I'm, I thrive on the people around me. And, you know, if people around me start to get negative, it's like, I find myself getting negative too. So if I can be positive and bring those people up around me, it not only creates, you know, it helps me be better, but it also makes my whole floor better. Okay, take breaks to exercise if possible. Okay, request shifts that allow more relaxation. Again, if possible. Now, this is going to be big. If you guys have been in an area, you know, for six months and you are just getting wrecked with calls, talk to your supervisors, you know, and request to go to a, a, a slower shift or a slower station. You know, I, I know I can talk to my director, you know, and our, our, our work day shift and our volume is high. You know, our call volume during the day is high. It is a lot higher than the night shift. Now, if I recognize that, all right, you know, my day shift schedule is just breaking me off. You know, I may talk to my director about, you know, it's like, hey, can, is there any way I can go to night shift for a little while? You know, just, the pace is a little too much for me right now. Okay, so you need to be able to self-reflect and recognize your own needs. Okay, and now seek professional help if necessary. All uh, right, there is nothing wrong with getting your mental health addressed. Nothing wrong with it. All uh, right, uh, so please, if you feel like you're not able to, to cope or you're not able to manage or you find yourself where your emotions are kind of getting away from yourself, seek mental health because it'll make you a better provider uh, you know, if you're going out with a clear mind. Okay, now critical incident stress management. Okay, now uh, dialing into it with a burnout may occur after exposure to a critical incident. Now it's going to be like you know loss of a coworker, loss of a child. Uh, you know, you have like these multiple casualty incidents, incidents that carry a high, high, high level of stress. Okay. Now, sufferers of critical incident stress also may have repeated mental images of the situation. So kind of getting into that post-traumatic stress, inability to function on subsequent calls, and fear of continuing work in EMS. We've had, we've had students that have had rough calls and, you know, really, like, questioned if this field was even the right field for them just because of what they were exposed to so early on in their career. You know, I know in, in nursing school, I had a, you know, one of my peers that they're like one of the first clinicals they had, it was, they had a patient code and I was like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know if I can do this, but it's like, kind of, cause they were like, is every day like this, you know, and it's, it's not, 
but uh, it can really make you question. It's like, man, it's like, is this the right spot for me? So with critical incident stress management, there are two different approaches. So you have a, and you guys will need to know this. Is this is testable right here? Uh, you have critical incident stress debriefing, and then you have critical incident stress diffusing. Now with debriefing sessions, okay. Critical incident stress debriefing, okay, that occurs 24 to 72 hours after the incident, okay, you have the providers that were on that call, and you also have mental health professionals there while you debrief that incident to help you manage and to process that call to kind of overcome the stress from that call. All right. Now with critical incident diffusing sessions, okay, that happens normally right after the call, okay, generally up to eight hours later, okay, and that just has the people who are on the call, all right, so it's like your shift, your crew, getting together, talking about what happened, okay, uh, to, to work through that stress. Generally, these only last about 30 to 45 minutes. So uh, with this, the debriefing sessions, obviously a little bit more in depth because you actually have mental health professionals there working with your team uh, to, to process it. Whereas with diffusing sessions, okay, happens quicker, okay, generally only lasts 30 to 45 minutes and just has those who are involved in the call. All right, now scene safety. So what is scene safety? Scene safety is making sure that your scene is free of any hazards, free of any dangers that could possibly pose a threat to you. So you must take measures to protect yourself, and that includes wearing appropriate PPE, okay? Uh, following proper rescue procedures, understanding if you are not trained in a rescue technique, you probably shouldn't be involved in the rescue. Okay, like, you know, if you're not trained in high angle rescue, you know, I wouldn't recommend you be the person rappelling down to go and get the patient. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, with violent patients, um, understand that there is a de escalation that needs to occur. Now, obviously, if the patient's swinging at you, that is no time to be like, sir, we use our words, not our hands, you know, because it's not going to do anything. But being able to rec recognize those early signs that violence could be coming uh, and, and de-escalating before it gets there is going to be big. And then lastly, advocating for your safety. Uh, that is super important. You know, I can tell you I've seen a lot you now, especially, you know, during clinicals and nursing school and everything. Uh, I was wrapping up nursing school during, you know, when COVID was really going crazy last year. And, yeah, I mean, I, I saw some people who were, you know, to the nines with their PPE. And then I saw other people who, you know, were were not, you know, and it's just... You don't want to put yourself into a situation if you don't have the appropriate PPE because you may, you know, be encouraged. That's like, hey, yeah, just go into that patient room. It's like, wait a minute, I don't have an N95 mask. Oh, you'll be okay. It's like, no, you must advocate for your safety. You must. All right. Protecting yourself from disease. So we have different pathogens, okay, that can cause disease bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoas, and helminths. Okay, now bacteria are single-celled organisms that can reproduce on their own, meaning they do not need a host uh, in order to reproduce. So some bacteria on the counter can you know, reproduce on the counter on its own. Now bacteria can respond to antibiotic therapy. All right, so oftentimes people will come in with some type of infection. Okay, now if it's a bacterial infection, we can treat that with antibiotics. Now I say it works, you know, usually uh, because there are some antibiotic resistant organisms that are out there, you know, like MRSA, uh, VRE, vancocillin resistant uh, kind of uh, bacteria that can really affect, you know, the antibiotics ability to work.
Now, viruses. Viruses actually require a host cell to reproduce. So, you know, a virus enters the body. It, you know, in a sense, invades a host cell. It then reproduces within that cell and then releases more of the virus and spreads to other cells, uh, which then allows it to spread through the body. Now, viruses do not respond to antibiotics. Okay, there are antivirals that are out there. Okay, but generally the best treatment for viral infections are to treat the patient's symptoms. So if they have a fever, you know, we can give Tylenol. If they are, you know, dehydrated because, you know, when your immune system's working overboard, you know, working overtime, uh, it's going to deplete the body of fluids. You know, if they're dehydrated, we can rehydrate them with a fluid bolus. You know, but we will focus on treating the symptoms while the body's immune system uh, does the work of eliminating the virus. You don't want to go on too far. All right. Now, with protozoa, okay, these are single-celled organisms that are capable of of movement. Now. Uh, what we're talking about here along the lines of like uh, malaria, okay, now found in soil, uh, illnesses include gastroenteritis, vaginal infections, and then of course malaria. All right, now helminths, those are going to be your worms. So examples include roundworms, lukeworms, tapeworms, and hookworms. Now, Biggest way that these uh, kind of spread is going to be like through contaminated like uh, fecal matter, like somebody gets you know stuff on their hands, um, and then they like prep food, and then it enters into your body through eating. All right. Now, with protecting yourself from disease, infectious diseases are contracted from those pathogens. Uh, if you ever see this, that the best way to protect yourself from infection is to wash your hands. Proper hand hygiene is the best way to protect yourself. It's like, man, hand hygiene, number one. It's even goes above gloves. Hand hygiene, the number one way to protect yourself against infectious disease. Okay, now the disease can spread directly or indirectly. Okay, directly meaning, you know, somebody sneezes, you know, in your face <laughs> and then you inhale those droplets that are floating through the air all right directly all right or indirectly somebody wipes their nose and touches a handrail okay now you're you know behind them you go in like they touched a doorknob you touch that doorknob right after them and now you rub your nose or you rubbed your eyes you created a, a portal of entry uh now you've contracted what they've had <laughs> All right, here's an example of an open wound, okay, that is infected, so it's saying it's a drug user. All right, big things, like I don't think they're always using uh, clean, sterile needles. Uh, oftentimes they share needles and allows these infections to spread. Okay, so standard precaution. Standard precaution is just the practice of protecting yourself against um, you know, infectious disease and those pathogens. Okay, so standard precautions of practice of protecting yourself against, uh, you know, infectious disease and pathogens. Now, with this, you need to make sure that you have standard precautions. Now, there are different levels of protection based off of what you come in contact with, um, but you need to make sure that they're available for you. You know, like, you know, in the ER, we uh, we see a lot of COVID patients that, you know, are, are coming in now that we can, we confirm, well, I need to make sure that I have all of the appropriate PPE for that patient room before I go in there. I need to make sure my, that is available for me. So I'll make sure I have an N95. I'll make sure I have a face shield. I'll make sure I have a gown, you know, and I have my gloves. Okay. Cause that is also then part of protecting myself, uh, and part of my scene safety. Uh, now, again, number one way to protect yourself is hand hygiene. Okay, hand hygiene. Okay, alcohol-based hand sanitizers. Now, these are everywhere, too. Like we have them on the walls in our ER. 
people carry hand sanitizer with them everywhere. They have that nice little disclaimer where it, where it kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria that's out there. Um, that's, that's our little disclaimer because it's always going to be that 0.1%. So with that, okay, understand that hand sanitizer does not kill everything. One of the big things that it does not work against is C. diff, okay, Clostridium difficile. Now, what that is, just lack of better words, it causes profound diarrhea, okay, and it is highly, highly contagious. So, if you have a patient that, you know, has just like constant watery diarrhea, I've had a patient that had diarrhea so bad that we, she had an oral medication, like a tablet. And it was like within a matter of hours that it had passed all the way through her GI tract so fast that the tablet came out still relatively intact. All right. That's how quickly everything passed through her system. Now, understand that if any of those droplets come on to me and then I create a portal of entry, then I can become you know, infected and have C. diff. All right, so I need to make sure because hand sanitizer doesn't work against C. diff that I actually every time I come in contact with that patient, I'm going to wash my hands with soap and water. All right, so here are some of the different PPE. So eye protection, okay, now they have like the face shields that are out there, lots of different eye protection, okay. Gloves, now gloves, is, guys, you may see it on an exam, gloves, uh, minimum amount of PPE you will take on every single call is gloves okay so the minimum amount of PPE you will take on every call is gloves okay uh, gown and a mask now you're seeing more of a mask versus a gown there are different masks there's a HEPA P100 the N95 mask understand with an N95 you actually get fit tested for an N95 mask uh, to make sure that it works with your face. Uh, if it doesn't, just know that that mask isn't effective. So if you don't have a fit test done, you don't even know the, the efficacy of that mask. All right, so yeah, EPA N95 mask. Now these are going to be more for your uh, airborne, you know, patients with tuberculosis, COVID. Uh, you'll be wearing your N95. Okay, now with disposal of equipment. Now, if you have anything that is soiled with blood or bodily fluids, um, you will dispose of that into a medical biohazard bag. All right, make sure you wash soiled uniforms or clothing after every shift. Guys, I'm not even allowed in my house like with the clothes that I wore in the ER. I have to actually strip down in the garage and throw them right into the laundry right off the bat because I don't want to bring in anything that, you know, I may have been exposed to uh, while working in the ER into my home. So like my shoes that I wear on shift stay in the garage. My clothes go immediately into the, into the wash. All right, now document any exposures that you have. All right, so if you do come into contact now, it's not to say it's like, oh, I transported a patient with, you know, we'll just say COVID, you know. Uh, so it's like, I need to report this every single time. It's like, not necessarily. It's like if you've been in contact with that person, you know, and you weren't wearing your appropriate PPE. Like, say they found out later that this patient had this and they were coughing and everything. Um, and you weren't wearing any PPE, which you should always be wearing your PPE. That's where it's like, it's, I would say something. Okay. Or you have like a, a needle stick. You would be reporting that exposure uh, to your work so you can then immediately go and get tested. All right, so sharp containers. Sharp containers actually, you know, are where you put your used needles. All right, we never want to recap needles. All right, I see it happen. It does, okay, but we never want to recap needles. Okay, once that needle is done, it needs to immediately go into the sharps container. Okay, you need to make sure you clean your ambulance after the call. All right, so they have like the, the purple cap or the orange cap wipes that you guys can use. The orange caps actually have bleach in them. Um, 
One thing too, if you have a patient that is coughing, I highly recommend that you have them wear a mask because if they're not wearing a mask and they're coughing, that is droplets that are going throughout your entire ambulance and now you're gonna need to wipe down everything because even though it may not look soiled, okay, it, it might be because the patient's been coughing, okay? And then always wash your hands, always wash your hands. If your hands are visibly soiled, Okay, don't just use hand sanitizer. Go and wash your hands. Okay, so cleaning, disinfecting, and sterilization. Uh, so with cleaning, cleaning simply is what it is. It, it, it's not going to kill everything. Okay, it's like cleaning, wiping things off with soap and water. All right, where disinfecting, that's where you're using, you know, the, the 1 in 10, like bleach wipe. Um, you know, to wipe down again, it doesn't, it works to kill bacteria, but it doesn't necessarily kill everything. You can think of disinfecting like hand sanitizer, 99.9%. .9%, okay. And then sterilization, sterilization actually neutralizes and kills everything. Okay. So oftentimes with cleaning and disinfecting, they kind of go almost hand in hand with one another, you know, we use the, the wipes, the disinfecting wipes to clean our ambulance. But if we're sterilizing something, understand that it is killing everything. And then once that sterile object comes in contact with something that is not sterile, okay, then that sterile object's no longer sterile. That's why like nurses work hard in the OR to protect their sterile field. And nothing that is not sterile can go into that sterile field because then everything is contaminated. All right, so protecting yourself from disease. Now, immunization. Immunizations are very important. I like to think of immunizations as like uh, kind of like a boot camp in a sense or training for your body. Um, simply put, you can look at it immunization like it is inserting a an antigen into your body for your body to recognize and to attack all right so let's just say we'll go with influenza because it's right there you know you get that annually so there are certain strains of the influenza uh, immunization that go out you know every year that people get all right so what it does you get the injection and it puts that antigen in your body your immune system will then respond to that all right, and it'll start to create antibodies. All right, now you'll have antibodies present. So if that strain of influenza enters your body again, okay, or that you know strain that your body's trained for, remember viruses require a host cell to reproduce to then spread to other cells. So simply put, your those antibodies can recognize like, oh no, hey, that's in that cell right now. We need to go there, isolate it, and, and, and neutralize it before it can spread. If you're not immunized, your body is gonna take some time to it's like, okay, hey, I don't recognize that. Oh, that's okay. Let's start creating some antibodies to go ahead and neutralize that. And now, you know, by the time your body's able to kind of have a counterattack on it, uh, it spreads significantly. Okay, to where it's starting to, you know, you might require then hospitalization in order to treat it. All right, so immunizations are important. So here are some of the immunizations that you could see. All right, now one thing with immunization, sorry, I know I just skipped the next slide. Uh, the TB test, the uh, purified protein derivative, purified protein derivative, or PPD. Okay, that is not an immunization. That is simply a test to see if you've ever been exposed to tuberculosis. Okay, a lot of people get that mixed up. Uh, so just the PPD, purified protein derivative, it is a, a test to see if you've ever been exposed to tuberculosis. Okay, now protecting yourself from disease, reporting exposures. So report exposures following state and local laws and your employer policies. Everybody. Everywhere is going to have a policy on reporting. Okay, I, I I don't think I've ever worked somewhere where they you know they were opposed to you reporting something. It's like no, always 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 report exposure. Okay, 
if you ever work somewhere and they're like, you know, discouraging you, it's like, I'd probably go work somewhere else. Okay. Now report the exposure as soon as possible to your supervisor, include the date, time, and details of the exposure. So let's say you have like a dirty needle stick. Okay. All right. Like you were assisting, you know, and you, for whatever reason, got a dirty needle stick where the needle was, you know, in that patient and then it stuck you. Immediately report that, you know, calls over, report it to your supervisor. All right. They will put you in and have lab work done up and actually start you on all these immunoglobulin B boosters and everything, even before that, that other person gets looked at to see what they have just to protect you. Okay. So you want to report it immediately so you can start the process of getting yourself treated. All right, now this is kind of a flow sheet. This is in your text. Uh, I'm not going to dial into this too much. Uh, just understand that, you know, this is like you have an exposure versus they find out uh, that your patient, say, had a disease and then they report it to you. Uh, understand, like, let's say you transport a patient, all right, and they had, we'll go with, uh, I don't know, like tuberculosis, right? Uh, and they find out that the patient had tuberculosis after the call. Well, that receiving facility will notify your designated officer, and then your designated officer will notify you, and then you can go and get tested, okay? And then you'll kind of be screened to make sure that you know, develop, hopefully, symptoms, all right? Versus you have that exposure where you have that dirty needle stick, you would then initiate the report uh, and then get treated. All right, so we're kind of going to, we haven't really dove into disease processes yet. So this is kind of just going to be a general overview uh, of these different disease processes. Don't get too uh, sucked into them. Uh, but with this, hepatitis. So hepatitis B and C, viral infections of the liver. Um, here, turn now. HEPA or hepato, uh, that is relating to the liver. Okay, itis is inflammation. So inflammation of the liver. Now, there are different you know, hep A, hep B, hep C, all right? So uh, there are different types of hepatitis that are out there. Um, now, the way I like to remember them, uh, if it ends with a vowel, it comes from the bowels, all right? So like hepatitis A, hepatitis E, uh, those are gonna come from like exposure to like in an infected patient's uh, feces. Like hep A, like if you have a, say somebody who has hepatitis A and they go to the bathroom and they don't wash their hands and they work in a food prep and now you eat that food, you know, I know it sounds horrible, okay, you can then contract hepatitis A, okay, whereas hep B, C, that's more, uh, more contact with blood and body fluids, all right. Now, infected persons can be asymptomatic but can still spread the disease, all right. Now, with inflammation of the liver, uh, you can see jaundice or yellowing of the skin. All right, so just if you see that, that's one of the symptoms that you could you can see. Now, tuberculosis, so respiratory disease. Now, with this, affects the lungs, but can affect other tissues. Now, what happens is this patient can cough, okay, and it spreads through respiratory droplets. You then breathe in those droplets, all right, and then you become infected by it. All right, now generally there is a, a process, I want to say it's like three stages of antibiotics that you get in order to treat this, but there are some antibiotic resistant forms. Now with respiratory, you do see uh, weight loss, you see fever, and of course you see difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, okay, some of those symptoms. Now AIDS. So AIDS uh, is a syndrome, so acquired immune deficiency syndrome. All right. Now this results from the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. Okay. So a patient gets HIV. Okay. Um, now HIV specifically attacks uh, CD4 immune cells. All right. So it attacks your immune system and lowers your CD4, okay, or those immune cells. Now, uh, in order to receive the diagnosis of AIDS, okay, we look for like the CD4 count to drop, alarming low, 
the patient to have a very high viral load, and then they start to become uh, exposed or you know uh, getting these opportunistic infections. Okay, so like low CD4 count, high viral load, uh, and all like they're starting to get pneumonias, they're starting to get cancers uh, pop up. That is uh, when they'll actually get diagnosed with AIDS. Okay, now more difficult than hepatitis B to transmit through occupational exposure. Now, HIV, that virus doesn't uh, live long outside of the body. Okay, so like say if there's blood on a surface, uh, it, it doesn't survive very long, whereas hepatitis B survives longer on surfaces. Okay, and impairs ability, body's ability to fight infections. Why? Because HIV specifically attacks the immune system. Okay, so SARS, so severe acute respiratory syndrome. We're in the midst of SARS right now. Okay, it's a uh, COVID. SARS virus. So with this, uh, it's spread by person-to-person -person respiratory contact, accompanied by high fever, headache, and body aches. Uh, you guys are, we're seeing the effects. I'm sure everybody's aware of a uh, coronavirus. Okay, it's a type of SARS virus is what we're doing because it attacks the lungs. Okay, West Nile, that's a uh, mosquito born. Okay, now with this, uh, Main people who have more severe responses to West Nile are the very young and the very old. Okay, for the most part, most people have uh, very limited symptoms, and when they do have symptoms, they're more uh, they're flu-like. Okay, now with this, the best thing for West Nile is prevention. So you know, getting rid of standing water around the home uh, or anywhere where mosquitoes might be able to breathe. All right, Ebola. All right, Ebola was uh, really big coming out of West Africa for a while. So with this, it is a virus now with viral hemorrhagic fever. Uh, hemorrhagic being it just causes you to bleed uh, from places that you're not supposed to be bleeding from. So bleed from the eyes, okay, bleed from the nose, internal bleeding. Now with this, uh, there was really big a few years back. Uh, I was coming out of West Africa, so we were screening a lot of patients, like asking questions when they had, you know, flu-like symptoms, uh, they had a fever, it's like, you know, have you come from Africa, you know, where'd you come from, you know, and then taking proper precautions against that. All right, now the Zika virus. Now the Zika virus uh, causes uh, a type of encephalopathy, uh, mainly that we'll see in, uh, in pregnant patients, so it doesn't necessarily affect the the woman as much as it affects the baby that she's carrying and it affects the the fetus's brain development so rarely fatal because birth defects the unborn child okay no vaccination exists prevention is the key okay just like with west nile it's limiting your exposure uh to mosquitoes so wearing your insect repellent limiting standing water okay multi-drug resistant organisms so like MRSA so uh, methicillin, oxicillin, staph resistant Staphylococcus aureus, okay, like things like that. VRE, Versa, uh, like all of those uh, antibiotic resistant organisms that are out there, uh, and they're just getting more and more common because of you know, maybe the overprescription of antibiotics. Okay, people not taking their antibiotics appropriately, uh, and instead of neutralizing the bacteria, it actually kind of aids in its evolution to become stronger all uh, right so with that okay it may cause pneumonia infection of the blood sepsis ear sinus and skin infections and peritonitis which is inflammation of the lining of the abdomen now make sure you protect yourself okay that we have it with these multi-drug resistant organisms we have contact precautions you know where you're wearing your glove and your gown uh, so that way, if you come in contact with something, you're you're protected, you know, with the gown and the gloves on. <laughs> okay, now protecting yourself from injuries, prevention strategies, use of vehicle restraint systems. I mean, wearing a seatbelt, safe lifting and moving technique. We have a chapter six, which is a whole chapter dedicated to lifting people. Okay, getting adequate sleep physical fitness and proper nutrition and using standard precautions. Don't mean to read from the slide, but it's very simply put here. Okay, now with protecting yourself, 
Okay, rescue operations. Again, a lot of these require specialized training. Okay, even for simple, you know, uh, more simple rescue operations, like say you're going to have to do a complex extrication of a patient. Uh, well, there are tools that the fire department is going to use to extricate a patient from the vehicle. Fire department, they're wearing helmet, they're wearing eye protection, they're wearing, you know, heavy leather gloves, they're wearing turnout gear. Okay, me working on the ambulance, I'm wearing my cotton shirt <laughs> and my nitro gloves and maybe my eye protection. All right, I don't have the appropriate PPE to enter in to assist in that. Uh, so make sure you protect yourself. Now, with hazmat, uh, the best guidance I can give you is just to recognize a hazardous material incident. Okay, so if you have a tanker that's, you know, topped over, you see uh, like a yellow gas or green smoke coming from somewhere. All right, kind of using your common sense, you know, hmm, that doesn't look normal. All right, you see like a placard identifying that substance, then we'll talk about it a little bit using your uh, emergency response guidebook, using the UN identification number. That's a hazardous material. I should stay away from it. You know, now with violence and crime scenes, that's more along the lines of uh, recognizing with crime scenes and violence. Uh, like, hey, this scene is not safe. I'm not going to enter into that until it's cleared. All right. And then biological, chemical weapons and mass destruction. Again, we've got a whole chapter for that coming up. Okay. okay. So with hazmat. So talk about using your binoculars, okay, and your emergency response guidebook. Now with that, there's a, a placard that has a UN identification number. Okay. It's a four-digit number that'll be able to use your emergency response guidebook with that number it'll tell you what it is okay and the standoff that you'll need with that substance so you know, always remain uphill upwind of whatever it is upstream of whatever it is so you don't have exposure and then request a hazardous material team okay here are some placards these do not bear un identification numbers however it does show you that there is a hazardous material in them Okay. Emergency response guidebook. Every ambulance should have one. Okay, with rescue situation, hazard, hazards may include, but not limited to, down power lines. So obviously, you want to have the electric company there to shut power. Uh, fire or threat of fire, explosion or threat of an explosion, hazardous material, or low oxygen environment. Low oxygen environment, that's going to be like confined space. So confined space requires specialized rescues. Okay, multiple issues here, right? You have power lines, you have traffic, so we have law enforcement controlling traffic. Hopefully the electric company's already filled power over here. Now, look at what these guys are wearing. Look at what this EMT's wearing. Okay, so she doesn't have appropriate PPE to be a part of that extrication. That EMT is protecting themselves. Now, once the patient comes out, her focus is going to be on patient care. Okay, now we have high visibility garments. Now, these are required to be worn on any roadside scene. Uh, the class mainly depends on the, the speed. So your class one, that's going to be more your parking lot speeds. Class two, like your intermediate speeds. And class three, that's going to be like your freeway situation. So Caltrans workers working on the side of a freeway. If you've ever driven by them and hit them with your flashlights, they glow like a chem light. All right, just highly reflective more for the, the speed of the roadway. Okay, examples of protective equipment. Now, violence and crime. Now, violence can come from anywhere, okay? Violence can come from your patient. Violence can come from a, you know, a family member or friend. Violence can even come from a bystander. There was a news article that I read down in San Diego where firefighters were on a bus to help a patient and some random person came out of nowhere and started stabbing the firefighter you know just maintain situational awareness okay maintain situational awareness of what's going on around you now if you suspect the potential for violence request law enforcement and do not enter into an unsafe scene you may approach a scene a woman comes out running screaming for help okay and then somebody comes and grabs her and pulls her back into the house you're not going to roll up your sleeves and be like, all right, man, let's go. You know, no, you're going to stay in your ambulance and you're going to contact law enforcement and have them make entry.
Okay, now a couple examples, things to look out for. So clandestine methane lab, methamphetamine labs, even some of these uh, marijuana labs that they got going on or farms that use a lot of toxic substances. I uh, read a book recently about uh, like marijuana farms in like Northern California. They use like really potent insecticides. It can be very toxic. Uh, so obviously we're not going to want to enter into any of those. This is an example of a chemical suicide. So fill a vehicle with like toxic gas. Uh, be aware, like not everybody's nice enough to put a, a warning up uh, that if you do enter into a scene and you start to feel lightheaded, you start to feel the symptoms like the air may be toxic, remove yourself from that scene. Okay, now some of the wellness principles, physical well-being is necessary for performing your job. Okay, so you do need to get, you know, adequate sleep, six to eight hours a night. A lot of people don't get that. And now I know that varies for everybody. Now me, like if I get nine hours of sleep, man, it's, it's glorious. Some people say that's too much. Or, or my wife, my wife sleeps like five hours and she's like up at five o'clock in the morning, like ready to go. You know, so, you know, it varies from person to person. Now, physical fitness does go a very long way. All right. The more physically fit you are, the more, you know, cardiovascular endurance that you have. Uh, the better your body will respond to some of these stressful incidents. If you're not used to your heart going at 130, you know, 120 beats per minute, you know, under stress, uh, you know, it could be exhausting for you compared to like somebody who does like a lot of high intensity workouts where their heart rate goes up, you know, a lot and they're kind of, they train their body for it. Okay, now core components of physical fitness, again, we talk about it a little bit more in depth later. Cardiovascular endurance, muscle strength, in a sense, muscle strength, your ability to move weight with each contraction. Muscle endurance, your ability to repetitively move weight with muscle contractions. Flexibility, the ability for the muscle to stretch. Okay, now body composition or BMI, now this is one thing that I'm not really going to dive into, but uh, it doesn't take into account a lot of different factors such as muscle mass. It simply will look at uh, the height of the person and the weight of the person to determine their uh, body mass index or body composition. Okay, and uh, that, that BMI is kind of we have our ranges uh, and you can have somebody who is very, very muscular. Uh, but be considered overweight or I've even seen like obese, you know, but like they're just like some yoked out person with a bunch of muscle mass uh, just based on their height and their weight. Okay, so I kind of, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, kind of hit on this muscle strength required for the frequent heavy lifting EMTs do. We will be lifting heavy patients. You will be lifting the gurney. All right, muscle endurance, ability of the muscle to function over time without fatigue. Think about yourself doing CPR. I've been in codes, you know, for extended periods of time. So generally, we'll run a code, you know, I've been in some 30 minutes, you know, and like after like, you know, third, fourth round of CPR, it's like, like, man, I'm, I'm exhausted. You know, it's like, man, it's very better. Hope I didn't hit the gym the day before because I'm even more exhausted. So understand muscle endurance is very important in your ability to function. I talked about this movement through full range of motion and flexibility ratio of body fat and total weight with your body composition. Okay. Ooh. Adequate sleep, eight to 10 hours of sleep each day. So on that, uh, I'm lucky when I get my nine hours and I feel great. All right. I'm very lucky. Like I said, my wife though, she can go like six hours, five hours and be totally fine. So, Working shifts that conflict with the body's natural rhythm can create physical, mental, and social difficulties. So one thing I'll say on that, I, I have worked the night shift, uh, and I did notice uh, an impact on my health. Um, I can tell you, like I like to think I'm a relatively healthy guy. Uh, I went on night shifts for a while, and I was like, man, like you know, my blood pressure went up, my cholesterol went up, even my my sh blood sugar went up. You know, my fasting blood sugar, and I was like, oh, man, this cannot be good for me. So I was very insistent on finding a day shift position because I know that my body works better, you know, on that schedule. Uh, let's see. All right. Smoking cessation. So 
a lot of places will actually require you to not smoke okay and a lot of places are even frowning now on uh on vaping i know that's kind of all the rage but uh as smoking cessation is big smoking cigarettes uh nicotine it, it is a stimulant okay it can cause vasoconstriction can increase the heart rate um with that it can lead to cardiovascular disease and smoking you know leads to respiratory diseases such as cancer and emphysema so don't smoke okay alcohol and drug related issues more along the lines of self-medication all right we're not fixing the problem we're just masking our symptoms we don't want to do that all right mental well-being now understand we will deal with stress but it's how you deal with that stress that is going to be important okay so over time if you have this distress okay where you're dealing with stress in a negative way it can affect you physically lead to disease and emotionally lead to mental health issues all right so that is the end of this lecture okay talked about death and dying guys please review and know the five stages of grief okay know how to manage job stress recognize the signs and symptoms of a stress reaction so we talked about acute delayed and cumulative stress know the difference between the three okay be aware of risk associated with emergency response okay standard precautions remember best way to prevent the spread of disease and reduce infection is to wash your hands minimum amount of ppe you'll wear on every call is going to be gloves okay and then assess all scenes for potential hazards to make sure they're safe if the scene is not safe do not enter all right and that concludes this class thank you